move over into the second session. All right, who in the room knows what a tikai is? What is a tikai? A tikai. Give us, give us that one a little bit louder for anyone who didn't hear. Little house. Thank you, Mr. Abraham. The tikai project. <laughs> the tikai project. Tikai, small house. T means pet from, is it Creole words? In Dominica, they speak a, a French patois. Um, has, origi has origins both in uh, West African language structures um, and also in terms of the, the, the grammar, some of the grammar and some of the vocabulary of French. Um, so T uh, connects with petit, small. Kai relates to hut, cas hut, um, small hut in origin. So already it's nodding to indigenous and Kalinago origins, already it's, it's nodding to African origins, West African origins as well. Um, so what we discovered in the course of our conversations, we collaborated with two organizations, SHAPE, the Society for Historic Architectural Preservation and Enhancement, a long acronym, but SHAPE is a nice clean one. Um, so they're really, really interested and been standing since, the, I've been doing their work since the, the 90s and even earlier, very interested in the preservation of the historic architecture of Dominica. So often when we think about Creole architecture, we think about vernacular architecture in the Caribbean, it often pertains to the Grand Plantation House and so on, right? What about the house of the everyday people and in what ways are these houses or might they be adapted to the meteorological conditions of the island, to the weather of the island? How are they ready for the weather of the island? And how have they been adapted over 500 years of interaction between Europeans, between the indigenous people, between the Africans who came and between the, the, the various different members of this culture that would emerge between all of these different cultural elements. And I really like this one, so we, we produced a book. It's not really a bone of contention, but I always put this on as the first one of my presentations. This isn't the, the, the cover of the book, but at, at one point I hoped it might be the cover of the book. Sorry, Guy Bram, because I know your uncle's, your uncle's house made it to the cover of the book, so big up to him because his house is amazing. The only reason I like this one is because it positions the house in relation to all of this other concrete-based development that's going on around the island and gives you something of the distinctive character of these small-handed houses that are still standing in relation to the weather, but also in relation to various different kinds of transformation and many yearnings for a particular kind of modernity which this house is seen to be something that stands against. But our argument is that these houses have adapted throughout the course of history, so we're interested in talking more about that. So the Tikai project is a collector, collective labour of love. Anyone who's familiar with my work, they'll know I'm an anthropologist who mainly works with, with people and much less with material culture and the material culture that they interact with. But I was led more by the inspiration of, of others, um, by architect Olive Bell, who was, who was almost our kind of our, the, 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 the sage and the kind of the leading mind of, of the project, who's a practicing architect from Girardel in, in Dominica, um, in the southwest of the island, just inland. Jeanne Royer as well, who was wonderfully introduced to us by my colleague Gabrielle. She's a student who's studying in Cuba, an architecture student, um, and has a deep, um, a deep um, love for the vernacular architecture of the island. Here's Jan taking notes as, um, as Sherman Ishmael, based in Maho, talks us through some of the structure. And he's a carpenter who inherited one of these homes from his father, and he's doing a lot of work to try and maintain it, adding new elements that are still in character with the history and tradition of these homes. <coughs> We're indebted usually to Metsi Didier, who did, who's also an uh, architecture student. She's based in China. Um, she did loads of the architecture, architectural drawing. But just to take us back a few steps in our process, what we aim to do is we aim to create a, create a collaborative process. So rather than it just being architects or uh, an architect and a researcher going to people and asking them about their houses, drawing up plans and so on, and then, and then documenting that in a book, our aim was to tell the story of these homes. My skills lie in interacting with people, so I was really keen to ask how these houses are inhabit, inhabited and what they mean to people. The good, the bad, and everything in between. But to do that, we didn't want to just have that knowledge for ourselves. The idea was that we wanted to invite students from Dominica State College enrolled in the architecture and engineering program. So this is a post-16 age, this is kind of college age students, um, for them to interact and to come on board with the project. So the idea was that they'd be working with students who COVID worked to our advantage in this instance. <laughs> 
because both Jan and Metsi were both home from China and Cuba respectively due to COVID, and we're excited to be engaged in the project. For everyone who was involved for both of these guys, as well as for the interns who would later come on board, it was a paid internship, so it was an opportunity for their time, their knowledge, their expertise to be, to be valued and recognized as well. And what we did is we went into the college. Olive, Olive Bell, who I mentioned before, who's a practicing architect, she talked to the students a little bit about the history of the Tikai. I did as well. And then we set them a challenge, and we invited them to submit a story. So they go out into their communities, they learn about one of these houses, they learn about the people who live there, about the story of the house, the storms perhaps it had survived, who they'd inherited it from, who perhaps had built it, what about the structure of the house that enabled it to, to stand in many cases for well over 100 years, and then they submit those stories. And then because we wouldn't be able to, of course, go out into communities and into these small houses with an entire classroom work of young people, um, we invited those who... It wasn't always about the quality of the writing, who could tell the most best stories. More than anything, it was about who was the most inspired. Um, and two students came on board, one of them, um, Zeth Stedman. Um, in fact, four students all together. Initially, we'd asked for two, and then the, the, our, our two colleagues, lecturers, um, Mr. Gies, uh, Mr. Ito, uh, they both twisted my arm, so we, we, we went up to four, which worked out really, really nicely, because it meant that there were different expertise brought to the, brought to the, to the um brought to the project. So Zef Stedman, as you can see, scrolling down, and he sat with, Met, with Mitzi um, in the house of Fidel Luke, who lives, in, who lives in Maho. Amy Victor came on board as well. Jane Nelson um, and Annabelle Wilson was, again, as our project manager and research associate, was in the background coordinating a lot of what was unfolding. And then, as mentioned, came together with Marika, who is a photographer, and who's also the president of SHAPE, the heritage uh, preservation society. So it all came, came together quite organically and then we had our team and we went from house to house searching every community that we could to learn more about these houses. They're not, these, are, these houses haven't really been documented before. And one of our main inspirations for doing this work was that in conversation with the lecturers at the college, we learned that uh, on the program that they do, two, a two-year program, there's, they don't have any textbooks that relate to the vernacular vernacular of the Caribbean, and they don't really learn about at all the, the architecture specifically of Dominica. So in a way, what we wanted to do was to have a, a book which would be as rigorously researched as we could, that would involve students and what their questions and what their interests were, but also the insight of architects, photographers, and heritage activists, as well as myself, who'd be gathering the stories of people, and to offer as rich, morning, and offer as rich and as rounded a, 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 a study of these homes as possible. And then if we dial back a, a few steps, we can get a little bit of context as to where the Tikai emerges from. Tikai, I mentioned hut. So we have the Moima indigenous houses, an A-frame style hut, thatched with um, various different kinds of grasses, veti, ver, or whichever kind of, kind of grass would be used. The frame was strong. It had a steep, steep pitched roof, so it was almost like a tortoise shell. The wind would come against it, push it down. It was well braced and structured so that the, the, the winds could sweep away all of the thatch, but the structure would, would ideally remain or could be rebound, and then you could thatch it again. The Watland Dove houses, we see multiple houses amongst the Afro descended population situated in yards. And what is incredibly important is that the yard would always be situated in relation to the laku, la court, the courtyard, the, the, the yard in which multiple families or multiple members of the same family, perhaps on family land, or renting from somebody who owns a yard, laku, and then usually it's the name of the, of the owner, um, would be tenants in that yard and would live in some communal relation to one another. Not always, not always, um, a praise song of that. It doesn't, it's not always a kind of a romantic, everybody, friends all the time. Beth gossip would flow the exchange, sometimes disagreement and so on between those in the yard, but there's a sense of collective identity often in relation to the yard. And we learned about that a lot in the course of, of, of the research for the book. Interestingly as well is the relationship to European shipbuilding. The joinery in terms of how the various different members of the structure are connected together using mortise and tenon joints that fuse with weather and that are able to sustain, and this is a, this is a, 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 a lithograph, like an etching from the, the Bristol archives. This is a ship that traveled from Bristol, which is where I was born and, and raised, um, to Dominica, um, somewhere in the, seven, the late 1700s. And it's, you can see the, 
the, um, the person who's, got the, who's, the, who's put together the journal, who's also done the sketch of the ship, on this particular night in the ship's journal, you can see that it's a stormy night. And there it's to invoke and to remind us of the fact that the incredibly strong joinery and structure that would hold together the ship was inherited within the Tikai. So there's something of the kind of the ways in which the Afro-descended population have taken up some of the technologies, the European technologies, and suited them to, to their own function. This would have been carrying goods, and though they don't mention in the ship's ledger enslaved people, it's true in that period, so there may have been enslaved people on board or working in some way on the ship, if not captive, or captive but working. Um, but whoever that's serving is not necessarily serving this population, of course it's not. And yet, that they would be able to repurpose the various different kinds of technologies which they've inherited from there in their own joinery, in their own carpentry. And then this is... Does anybody know what's going on in this picture? Can anyone hazard a guess at what's taking place? I know it's a little bit small for those at the back. I see someone nodding. Go ahead. Anyone? I can't hear. It's a kind of a party, okay. What was that one? Is it, is it an outside school? Is it a party? Anybody else have a sense of what's going on here? I, I heard, what was that? Wedding. Wedding? Because we've got the white. Okay, so what's taking place here? There's a man who's riding a house. Why is this man riding a house? Why are all these people at the bottom of the house? Who, what, are these people, what are these people doing at the bottom? They're moving it. They're moving house. So basically, Okay, so what I wanted to evoke with this, when we think about the origins, we think about where and how these houses emerge. Slavery legally ends, right? And I say legally ends because it's a very complex ending. Some people still were under apprenticeship, some people were still in bondage in various different kinds of ways, or at least the freedoms which they gain were, were limited in terms, of, in terms of movement and so on. Slavery still, nonetheless, legally ended across the, across the, um, the, the Brit British West Indies, in 1838. At that point, the people who, the working class, the laboring classes who inhabited the plantations, who were working, formerly captive on the plantation, typically owned their houses, but they didn't own the land on which their houses sat. So you had a choice. Either you can continue to work for your former masters for relatively meager pay, feeling like your life hasn't transformed radically, or you can flee the plantation and you can find somewhere else to, to live. In many cases, people disassembled their houses, in many cases, they came to live on the plantation's edge. The prime land, the flattest land of this incredibly mountainous island, was typically around the was typically where the plantations were, right? So most of that land was owned, and so you wouldn't be able to quote unquote squat on that land because you would be removed. Now, around the strip of the island was an area called the King's Free Chains. This has been quite well documented. Around 60, 60 meters from the sea, inland. The idea is that this was reserved for jetties, it was reserved for fortification, the various different bits of, of infrastructure for the plantation society. And yet, because it was deemed to be crown land, then those who were fleeing the plantation, and it wasn't private property, they were able to settle that land. And so what happens is you've got a coastal strip that is the most inhabited part of the entire island right, right around the perimeter of the island, less, coast, less the case in the southeast because it was much more rugged on that side, and there was rugged land that people could occupy and people could, could gain rights to. But generally speaking, over the years, people would either be close to the falaise, that's Creole for the drop, so the steep escarpments, these are not prime bits of plantation land, these are areas that often are quite precarious as well in terms of uh, landslides and different things we mentioned before, um, but people would come to inhabit those areas. And in those areas, the, the houses were quite densely populated. And so what would happen is, this is just to give you a hint of the ways in which houses will move according to changing and sifting circumstances. The pragmatic way in which, according to your, your, your status, you reside on a piece of land, people would often move their houses. And equally, they'll adapt them with new members of the family. They'll expand them. They'll grow as, as families get bigger. People might, in some cases, you even had uh, structures which are two tikai which are joined, and then the, the walls would have been knocked through, and so it would be a larger structure. In other cases, people have added on, and we're talking now, concrete bathrooms and, and so on, different conveniences that they wouldn't have had before. And so they adapt over time. We see an outline of Dominica here. It's a little bit faint, but this is the general shape of the island. This is the shape of the island, for those who can see. And then we're now in Maha, which is in the, in the, um, on the west coast, almost halfway up the west coast, about a third of the way up the west coast. And these are some drawings which will just, just give you a sense of the structure of a tikai. And this is at the house of Fidel Luke, a photo taken by Marika Honeychurch. 
anyone who sees a ganja plant, ganja, ganja is now decriminalized, so don't go call anyone up and say that they're <laughs> breaking the law. Shingles on the outside. The shingles, only a third of them is exposed to the weather. So as the rain beats down on them, as it's beaten down today, and Dominic gets incredibly high amounts of precipitation, the shingles, only a third of them is exposed to the weather, and so as such, you wouldn't, and they're mounted on boards, you wouldn't get the, the rain and so on coming through. And yet the house is still able to breathe because they're sat overlapping, and so little bits of the moisture is able to be released when it then gets hot, and so the house doesn't, doesn't rot. Raised up on, on wood pile foundations, pillar tree, as, as the old school people would have called them, well moored and anchored, and yet, Inundations of rain, the water can flood underneath, flash flooding, um, the house wouldn't be exposed so much to that as well. Steep pitch roof, again as we've mentioned, well braced, um, with collars across or trusses in some instances, giving it a, a, a great deal of, of strength against the wind. Though we have here, um, we have here the, uh, I'm forgetting the name of that particular kind of roof, not the hip, the, the gable roof, yeah. So as we've got the gable roof here, in many cases what we have is the, is the, um, the four-sided four -sided half hip, hip gable, you might call it. So it's got the little short gable end just here, but you still have some side of the roof. So the winds that come from any side against that steep pitch presses down almost like a tortoise shell. Strong structure inside rather than a lower pitch roof where the wind can come under and make it sail away. Now we've got quite technical, we've got quite historic, quite quick. Also, we have internal vents. So a lot of it is about cooling the house as well, about keeping the, the house, house cool too. You know when a hurricane is coming because it gets incredibly hot, stiflingly hot, sometimes uncomfortably hot. These houses respond to the, to the, to the heat before the hurricane even comes, insofar as unlike concrete houses which absorb sun throughout all of the day, and then nighttime when it's cool outside, they're still emitting that radiation, that heat, radiating that heat, I should say, back into the house. These houses are incredibly well oriented in terms of these windows that open, often thought about in relation to the breezes of the trade winds as they blow from east to west, enabling ventilation to come through the house, cooling the house and so on. Um, but also the fact that they're made out of wood means that they're not soaking up and absorbing all of that, that heat in the same way as a, as, a, um, as a concrete house would. And so their dwellings adapted to their total environment. A meteorological art form, as someone, Jan Morris, referred to, Caribbean vernacular more generally, meteorological art form. From necessity in relation to the weather, a certain kind of art, there's a certain kind of attention to detail. And they're built as Lennox Honeychurch, the national historian of Dominica, um, says with disaster in mind. And as one of our interns on the project said quite, quite profoundly, they were built not against, but with the motion of the wind. They don't try, they allow the hurricane to be, as, as Olive Bell put it in, in other terms, they allow the hurricane to move over them rather than just standing like a great monument against the wind, hoping that they can be stronger than it. And they allow the hurricane to be so much so that this house in, in Pottersville, this is just in the north of, of Roseau, which is in the southwest of the island once again, was blown from its foundations during Hurricane David in 1979. We can see onlookers across the road looking at the house. We can see a tiny bit of road left for a vehicle to pass. It was blown from its stilts, its wooden piles, and yet it still sits all but intact, despite being completely blown over by the, or blown off of its foundations. Just shifted, but has remained strong and still standing, despite the, the force of a Category 4 hurricane. And they're built with incredible understanding and knowledge of the woods and of the forest, by woodcutters who journey high up into the forest. In this case, we've got a pit saw documented. This is in Dominica in La Plaine, uh, on the east coast documented in 1962 by the famous uh, folklorist and ethnomusicologist um, Alan Lomax. And in his journey through Dominica, he documented the songs that came with the pit saw. There'd be a group of guys, one set below, only one at a given time, but they're taking turns. There'd be one below, one above. There's a wooden structure. There's a piece of, there's a piece of wood that's across. The guy above and the guy below, both either end of a saw, and they're cutting as they go, and the song is propelling them forward as they're propelling each other forward. In their, work, in their work group. And here we see in the heights above Rosa, in, uh, sorry, in the Rosa Valley, in a, in a community called Lord Out Way Up in the Mountain, we see a tikai documented in 1903 in a family yard. And it sounds like I've been doing all of this to try and plug the book, 
if you're interested in the book. But also, this doesn't just take, take you to where you can buy the book, it also takes you to the website so you can get a bit more context on the things that I've been, been talking through so far. Um, and what we feel is quite important about this text is that whilst you've got one or two other examples, and this is not to do, do down this work because we've leaned so heavily, I, I know nothing with, about these houses. Well, no, I would, I would know a lot because I've spoken to a lot of people and I've interacted with people who live in them, but in terms of that, that knowledge base and that foundation, particularly in architectural thought, um, Casantie by two scholars from the Francophone Caribbean, from uh, Martinique, I believe, key in terms of understanding these homes. Caribbean style, which is a kind of quintessential coffee table book about uh, Caribbean architecture, but that seems to lean more heavily towards, again, the plantation house, these big, grand, more opulent structures. And then the lesser known historic Rosa, which does a more localized study of the, the, of the, the, the houses in the capital, Dominica Rosa by Lennox Honeychurch. But none of, these none of these books really focuses on the voices of those who dwell in and inhabit those houses and what those houses mean to them, how they've inherited it, and how they make sense of them. Again, if people want to just take a click, I'm not going to send you off on some activity, but you'll just have it saved. But equally, if you go on the website and go on the blog section of the website, you'll be able to find out more information about these houses. And also, how to get the book if you want to. <laughs> the, good thing is, the good thing is that some of the money from the book goes to the same heritage um, the same heritage organization um, who are doing the work to try and preserve these houses on the ground, which, yeah, and also the photographer um, who also gets a proportion of the royalties, she's also a member of that society as well. So you've got a kind of custodian um, as well as, yeah, the collective that are doing that work. And so just to journey into and get a glimpse of some of these homes, so this is Sylvan uh, Parillon, or Watchy, Watchman as they call him, because when he was very young, the other a flashlight, and they used to call him Watchman when they'd see him out as a little boy in the village when they didn't have street lights, and he'd be around flashing his torch and enjoying himself. From his tikai, which is in an area called the ghetto, which is in the, in, in the center of Koliho, which is the village that my grandfather's from, he relaunched the carnival tradition. There was a carnival tradition in Estilius called Van Mauve, which is a which is a dangerous kind of carnival tradition. Um, under, under this particular costume, in menacing garb with heavy, long um, skirt and, and overalls. Guys and, and women as well would march through, the, march through the village chanting, smashing bottles, getting on bad and so on in the village. Um, and it's a kind of a dangerous kind of masquerade. It was outlawed at a certain point because it was associated with various different kinds of rebellion, but also with um, different incidents that had happened in Carnival in town with a fire um, that involved uh, several people losing their lives when they were wearing a different kind of costume but also had kind of threads and tassels on it. In the 1980s, him and his friends decided to um, make goat, goat skin drums. Um, they stretched, they, they got the hides of the goat, they stretched it themselves, they created their own drums, they dried it over the cross that is in the center, center of the village outside the Catholic church. They doused it with rum to give it a blessing as it dried in the sun, and then they, 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 they assembled their costumes and they, they ran their mass again on the road, and they got on bad and dangerous. He's a kind of a cultural store, and, the, the house represents something of this cultural hub in the center of Koliho village. And it was interesting because one of my uncles who's from the village, my mom's cousin, he was one of the last people, and he died last year during the time when we were in Dominica, but he was one of the last um, carpenters who had the knowledge to be able to maintain and, and, and restore some of these houses. So one of the main challenges that what she said he has is as termites begin to make their way through this structure, which is over 100 years old, um, is finding the right materials and the right uh, skills to be able to work to maintain his house. And the imported woods that you get, people, there aren't so many people felling wood in the high forest. Unfortunately, we didn't, we didn't get as much of the wood becoming available as might have been hoped from the film with, um, in the film with, uh, with Shaddy. You see where he's got the, the chainsaw man. A lot of wood fell down during the hurricane. This wood is, is felled by the moon. If you don't cut it in the right course of the period of the, of the moon cycle, it can get, um, it, it's more susceptible to termites, it's more susceptible to ants. Maria fell on a good moon to cut, which was almost suspicious, but they weren't, they, they weren't necessary because everybody was thinking about their immediate needs and, of course, this, their immediate survival. There weren't as many people cutting as perhaps could have if, if, if that planning was in place to be able to, to, be able to um, cultivate all of this wood that had been fallen down and then eventually would, would rot in the high forests. Um, and so folks like Watchy have a real challenge of being able to maintain their houses. I've got the last couple of minutes of 
of this session. So the last person I'll speak to is Dr. Berkey Peters, and I'm a little bit biased because I've taken you to my grandfather's village, and then I'm also taking you to the football savannah where I like to play football, um, and where my, my football team in Dominica trains. And for me, these stories are quite inspiring because they, for myself and a lot of others in, in, in Dominica who had never really thought about these houses, you realize that you're spending a lot of your time close to these structures, but you don't really realize much of the richness of the, these stories. In a similar way as any kind, of, any kind of detailed research about everyday things, you might pass them every day, but you're not aware of their significance. Lennox Honey Church, again, historian of Dominica, he, he gave me this photo, or he shared this photo with me. This is Newtown, Savannah, in just uh, south of Rosa, or part of Rosa still, but to the south, um, immediately after Hurricane David, maybe two days later, in 1979. There's a structure across the savannah, and the savannah looked a bit different then. Now it's, now it's fenced, now it doesn't have a path that goes through the middle. You still have the football goals, but you don't, you don't have so many goats and stuff parading up and down on there. Um, this structure was almost entirely intact. Almost nothing happened to it, as you can see, roofs and so on, especially the larger concrete houses destroyed all around the place. This is Mr. Berkey's house. Mr. Berkey's lived there for, for, for many years. He, although he wasn't actually there for Hurricane David, um, he was in Barbados at the time, which, interestingly enough, they thought that Hurricane David in 79 was going for Barbados, where he was, but it actually changed its course last minute and it ended up in Dominica, and causing incredible destruction. Mr. Berkey was a psych is a psychiatric nurse, or he was, he's now retired. I crossed out Mr. because they now called him Dr. Berkey, or the guys on the Savannah did, because every time when there was a football match and someone had an injury, they knew he had some medical training, so they'd go to him and he'd dress the wounds and so on. And he told us an incredible story of him being alone in his 70s inside the house during Hurricane Maria. He said, nothing much happened to the house, and this is almost quote, quote in verbatim, just one, two galvanized fly away. So one or two of these roofing sheets flew off, but generally speaking, much as it had in 1979, the house was very much still standing. His grandfather was a relatively wealthy man, had all girl children, I want to say like nine or ten children. Yeah, because yeah, you, were, you were there for the, for the session, weren't you? For the um, visit, sorry. Nine or ten children, if not more. The right number is in the book. There you go. Like, don't, <laughs> don't, don't misquote me here. But um, each of the daughters um, received a house. And this was one of the houses from his grandfather. And it's incredible to visit him there because he told the story of, of shutting one shutter battening it down, you've got these uh, spinning bits of wood that are locked down at the back that are able to, to close the hurricane shutters, but where the house is relatively old, one would fly open, and then he'd go to shut that one, and then as he shut that one, another would fly open. So eventually, with the rain coming into the house, eventually he hunkered down in the, in the back room, I think he was under the bed, and then rode out the storm, storm there, unscathed. And then when we visited him on that day, it was incredible because we realized that when Mr. Berkey goes to town, he doesn't need to lock his house, he doesn't even need to close his, his shutters. Because there are a group of young men around the village, young men who often elders of a similar age to Mr. Berkey might talk disparagingly about, all oh, those boys, they're just there doing nothing, they're smoking drugs, they're not doing nothing with their life, whatever it might be. But in Mr. Berkey's case, they take incredibly good care of him. Whenever he needs something, they help him out. Maybe whether it's carrying water for him, whether it's keeping an eye on his house, whatever it might be. And just to give an example of that, at the end of the day, once we finish talking with him, just further up the savannah, somewhere around this corner, there's a bar. And there's a, there's a restaurant who was cooking food, like a, a one-pot dumpling, all kind of different fish, different things in there. And at the, uh, as, as we're leaving, I bought a couple of drinks, and then we're just heading out, and I said, oh, let me, let me pay a little bit of money for, for Mr. Berkey to take some lunch. And the guy turns to me, and with a, with a stern, protective tone, he turns to me and he says, Mr. Berkey's safe, man. At that point, okay, I knew he was going to take care of I checked my seat, I did my thing. But it was, it, was, it was nice to see that in here. Like, there was a sense of reciprocity for the care that he has within members of the, four members of the community or, or over the years as, as Dr. Berkey, as they knew him, taking care of them in some cases as kids with great knees or whatever it might be, and the care which they now take care of him in later life. And whilst it's not a perfect, perfect situation, he doesn't have running tap water, for instance, in the house, so that's the walk, walk for water, people have to help him with that. He does have neighbours around that, that take good care of him. And so these are just glimpses of some of the kinds of stories. I won't be able to go into Silma Thomas's, um, but what I will just, um, what I will just <coughs> close with, um, and Silma Thomas, interestingly, I'm not going to go all the way in, but just to mention, 
she was actually, all people in her part of Rosa, or in most of Rosa, particularly in particularly elder folks like herself, were told to go and um, shelter in a school, in the Dominica Grammar School. Her house was almost unscathed. The Dominica Grammar School, uh, the river, the, Dom the Rosa River, um, actually entered the school, and they had to very quickly be rescued, and so much so that her partner, who's, who's now passed away since, since the interview, we did, we did meet him, um, he actually he was, in a, he was in a wheelchair, and so much so that they had to pull him from the flood water and his shoes got washed away. Um, and yet the house, nothing happened to it. So she said in future, she said there's warnings to leave, she said she's staying put in her house, and she's not going anywhere. Um, but in her instance, she actually inherited that house. She was a domestic worker and inherited it from a lawyer, two sisters who were both lawyers, and one of them left the house for her after, after many years of service, freeing her from the burden of rent, which was quite powerful in terms of her own story. And so Dominica, I guess, is at something of a crossroads because in the wake of disaster, a lot of these kinds of structures are being built um, by government with, with um, outside private, um, private money, and in some cases, um, in exchange for the sale of, sale of passports as the kind of funding stream to, to do this kind of work. And it's very necessary in terms of people needing shelter, many in quite the kind of vulnerable locations that we've spoken about. But these houses would be built in terms of their design very much against the wind, if you will, if we're, if we're returning to, to, um, to Amy's way of putting it. This is some of the destruction that can be wrought where, and this is again from Hurricane David, where you've moved away from some of those, some of those building practices which are tried and tested. And yet there are some tourism uh, locations, this is Jungle Bay uh, in the south of the island, which are working with similar kinds of um, roof style structures to do something, and also the shingles as well, um, and also the raised foundations and so on, to do something that's quite reminiscent, in a way, of the Tikai. So perhaps we're at the crossroads in terms of the future. And in some instances as well, and this is a Canadian woman who's done this in the Northeast, some people are renovating their houses or their Tikai and putting them on Airbnb, showing off some of the beauty of them. And what we did, what we did try to open up was a conversation with Dominican residents who might have these houses sitting empty on their land and might be able to realize some of the potential of them as just one potential avenue. So none of these are kind of a kind of a, a necessarily a, a cure-all in terms of the future of, of the housing predicaments um, of an island uh, faced by hurricanes, um, particularly in the context of climate change supercharging these, these storms. Uh, but we are at a crossroads in terms of possibilities in different different directions. So yeah, I'll leave it there. This one, in case there's this one, we're gonna drink some water and yeah, stop talking for a while. <laughs> Is it all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> um, thanks for that. Was brilliant. I, re I really enjoyed that. I, I just wanted to ask, like, when you, in the building of houses, is there a sort of, um, well, there's a couple of questions. One is about just the knowledge, local knowledge about um, building houses, drainage of war from hurricanes. Does that travel across? the island, mm -hmm. and is it different from the Atlantic side, which mm -hmm. tends to be rougher, than the Caribbean sea side? Mm -hmm. Does that the yeah, yeah. question make sense? Yeah, you know what was really interesting for us? So, um, all right, so in the first instance, if we're going back to the kind of the, the different traditional style houses, which will have their different names across, across the Afro-Americas, more broadly, you can say, because um, the, the tikai would be reminiscent of what they call the chattel house in Barbados, or what they call the shotgun house in New Orleans, which has some roots in, in Haiti, and those who, those who left or were carried and taken after the Haitian Revolution by the planters who, who fled and, and moved to New Orleans and to the parts of Louisiana. Um, there are lots of common resonances between either of them, between each of them. And, but the reason I say in search of origins is because to tease out where those different elements, what configura configuration of these different elements and, and which ethnic groups come together to create a particular kind of house, it's hard to say like what the particular route for why a house is different in one context versus another. And in some instances, it's to do with, uh, to do with the, the nature of the landscape as well. So where Dominica is particularly prone to flooding, you might have higher raised foundations in parts of Barbados where they don't have similar kinds of, they don't have the same kind of um, topography, and so the houses might not be raised so high. But also, it might also relate to what materials are available too, because Dominica, as you can see, I mean, this isn't the best example here because we're not going all the way into the heights, um, but Dominica's got copious amounts of forests, and so those 
um, in an earlier era would venture into the virgin forest and, and they acquire the tropical hardwoods that, that they need for what they're, what they're doing. But in some islands, like Barbados, for instance, which was deforested so early, early on within, its, within the colonial project there, um, and within the plantation project there, the, the wood wouldn't be available locally, so it's about where it's getting sourced from and the nature of what materials as well. Um, but in Grenada, I'm sure you've probably seen similar examples to what we're, what we're, what we're interested in here. The interesting thing on the Atlantic side, we've got one or two folks in the house who might know the Atlantic side well as well, um, is that when we were doing, our, when we were doing most of our, um, our research, we didn't find so many examples on the Atlantic side, and I wonder if that's to do with the history of bananas. That's, that was our kind of theory, was that um, there were, in some of the more rural areas, there were, there were, there were larger, small holdings of, of bananas during the banana era in the 20th century, and particularly the height from the mid, around the mid-20th century, before the decline, which meant that family members were able to earn enough money to be able to send people to university, to be able to build large, large concrete houses, which would have replaced the smaller wooden houses. So that was our kind of theory. I don't know to what extent um, that would be the case. We did find in the, in the southeast, close to an area called Grand Bay, um, we did find a few examples. Um, Pont saint jean we found an example. So some parts on the Atlantic coast, we did find examples, but many more were on the west coast. But that's perhaps because people didn't have access to much land, and so where their houses are is where they stay and where they sit, and so they build in and renovate within that context. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, I was just saying that it's also because of frequent landslides on the Atlantic side, because of how steep the mountains are. So the houses get damaged by landslides and also when um, rough sea and stuff like that. So houses are like thick ice. So really they, don't, they wouldn't really last. Mm. Yeah. Always have to rebuild the building. And so, Kayla, if you don't mind me saying, it's from the southeastern village of Stowe, and so would, would have that everyday knowledge. So would you say that you see there's probably not many in your community at all. My community, especially, is um, fairly new. It's, it's not, I don't think it would be old enough to have a generation. Mm. Because my community is like a child of Pilita and Pilita when we have. Mm. And we looked, I think I found, I think we found one in Pilita Van, but again, the people who we wanted, who we would have spoken to about the house, they weren't so, they weren't so sure about the video thing because of the situation there. Um, but yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Much steeper topography and so on. And so it, and, and again, that opens up the question about, about what we've been thinking about these houses in relation to, in relation to flooding, in relation to hurricane winds and so on, but in relation to landslides, where the foundations can get undermined. If they're just standing on wooden piles, it's a whole other conversation from if you're casting a deeper stone foundation, which might be able to hold up. Yeah. Also population, because you remember, as you, as you were saying, they were moving their houses to where they were allowed to stay, historically. Um, and then also, too, most of the population at that time would have been on that side because of seas and defense and, you know, forts where mm -hmm. the trade is and whatnot. Because obviously, with the, rough, with the rough Atlantic side, they wouldn't put forts on the Atlantic side. Mm -hmm. So that was going to be on the other side. The NASA population says as well. Probably why you found more over there as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Any more? I think we've pretty much reached the close of that session. We've gone a little bit over time. So, thank you everybody for your contribution. Yeah.